what really is a woman in the Bible that captures the idea of someone that really has been faithful in prayer through pain? Uh, Hannah came out strong because uh, Hannah, in the Old Testament, in 1 Samuel 1, Hannah was a woman who had a testimony of prayer in a valley of despair. I mean despair. And so through her pain, she kept on praying. Her name means grace or favored. Now, I, I told people yesterday, you know, Joy and I have been working on Greek is much easier for me. So we've been working on the Hebrew. And I learned, Judy will love this, Hana. <laughs> Hana and Penny Na. But I'm not going to call them that. I'm going to do the typical, just Hannah and whatever in the Hebrew. So Hannah. In fact, in 1 Samuel 2, she gave us this magnificent prayer, which was prophecy of Jesus Christ's coming. But she had had a broken heart. And in her sense of failure, God moved. Um, I wanted to talk before we get into the specific scripture, and I'm going to read 1 Samuel, at least the first 11 verses. I want to tell you that prayer is the most important foundation. It is the most important thing you can do. I've said often that people say, I don't know what to do, but I'll pray. And I'm going, I need that. I need that underneath everything. Because that needs to be, I said, the sentence, not the punctuation at the end. Everything else God can do because of prayer. Amen. And so Hannah um, was a, a woman of prayer. Now, she had a lot of pain, and I'm going to tell you that pain comes for a variety of reasons. Pain comes from, number one, it comes from, not number one in importance, but sometimes self, choices that we make, and that brings about pain. And so, and, and by the way, those choices might be good or bad choices, and there's consequences with your choices. So if you um, make a poor choice, you might live with some consequences at times, even though God forgives. Uh, you could actually make a good choice to go with Jesus all the way, and your family turns on you, and he said there will be persecution in this world. There will be trouble because you made a choice to follow Christ. I've seen that in families where they turned on him because of that. But that's one of the reasons for pain. But, you know, <laughs> and there is satanic attack, no doubt about it. That is another reason that sometimes we're in pain. But sometimes we are, you know, if, if you're driving 80 miles an hour in a 65 zone and you get three tickets in a row, you don't say, oh, Satan is really attacking my finances. That's not. It is. That's not Satan. That, that is a little bit of rebellion on your part, and that's consequences. And that's what I mean. But sometimes we, you need to know that what you're up against and you're looking at people and you're all upset at people, you're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but you're wrestling against principalities and powers. And even if God is doing something and you are in your situation because God is doing something, Satan will still provoke, especially, oh, well, you know that from the wilderness, Jesus in the wilderness. He's there by the will of God. The Spirit led him into the wilderness. And yet Satan came and attacked him during that time. He's there under God's providence. And I want you to know something this morning. You may be in a position that's uncomfortable, and Satan may be taunting you, but it is God's providence because he's doing something that is a far greater purpose. Remember this, if you're in pain this morning, God may be working in that pain for a greater plan than you ever imagined. Do you believe that this morning? Yes. Amen. All right, let's read verses 1 through 11 and uh, of chapter of 1 Samuel, chapter 1. There was a man from Ramathine, Zophim, in the hill country of Ephraim. His name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tobu, son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. Why didn't we think of those names, Joy, when we... Okay, yeah. 
Whenever Elkanah offered a sacrifice, oh, I'm sorry, this man would go up from his town every year to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of armies at Shiloh, where Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, served as the Lord's priest. They were the Lord's priest. Whenever Elkanah offered a sacrifice, he always gave portions of the meat to his wife, Penina, and to each of her sons and daughters. But he gave a double portion to Hannah, for he loved her even though the Lord had kept her from conceiving. Do you hear me? Don't give the devil credit when God is doing something that's uncomfortable. Right. So her rival would taunt her severely just to provoke her because the Lord had kept Hannah from conceiving. Year after year, when she went up to the Lord's house, her rival taunted her in this way. Hannah would weep and would not eat. Hannah, why are you crying? Her husband Elkanah would ask. Why won't you eat? Why are you troubled? Am I not better to you than ten sons? On one occasion, Hannah got up after they ate and drank at Shiloh, and the priest Eli was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. Deeply hurt, Hannah prayed to the Lord and wept with many tears. Making a vow, she pleaded, Lord of armies, if you will take notice of your servant's affliction, remember and not forget me, and give your servant a son. Did you notice something? If you will take notice of your servant's affliction, and if you will give your servant a son, I will give him to the Lord all of the days of his life, and his hair will never be cut. So let's take a look. Hannah was under great pressure. In verses 5 and 6, we tell you why. Because number one, she is being prevented from something. that she, She's a childless mother. Now, in the Jewish culture, it was huge during those times because God wanted the nation to procreate and to expand. But it had come down to the fact, and that's why there were in cases a couple of wives or a wife. I won't explain that now. But it was allowed at that time, but not God's full plan. It just wasn't. But. She So she was prevented and she was desperate because her rival, Elkanah's other wife, Penina, had children and she couldn't give Elkanah children, her husband. So she was not only prevented from something that she was desperate for, she was provoked. And I'm saying sometimes, I, I, there are times in my life that I am praying and praying. And I want to tell you, it's years. It's years. And I'm praying for something. But you know, did you ever realize that even though you say God is working and he's not done yet, and I'm going to trust him, and I'm going to keep praying, yet there are times the enemy comes into that and begins to taunt, where is your God? And so that was going on. It's bad enough that she has an unfulfilled desire, a deep desire in her heart. I don't know. I don't know what desire you might have in your heart today. But it's really something when you're burdened and you're interceding for something and you don't see movement. But then it's really something because the enemy will come in and try to pull the rug out from under you. But there's another thing that's important in verses 7 and 8. And let's take a look at that. It says, year after year, she went up to the Lord's house. Her rival taunted her in this way. And Hannah would weep and not eat. And really, we don't need verse 8 so much. But here, year after year, she was provoked. There was a pattern. But here's what's important in that passage. That year after year, she kept going to the temple. And see, they would go to the temple. 
They could do some things back at home, but once a year they were to go to the temple and, and bring an offering unto the Lord and bring a sacrifice. And no matter how discouraged she might have been, she kept praying year after year, don't get up, don't give up, don't quit. And even though year after year you may be taunted, don't quit. They waited some 400 years between the last book of the Old Testament and for Jesus to show up without a prophet in the land. But Jesus showed up. He's never late. And let's look at verses 4 and 5 and back up. Elkanah's double portion. So even though she was going through all of this, and whenever Elkanah offered a sacrifice, he gave a portion to Penina and to each of her sons, but he gave a double portion to Hannah, for he loved her. Yeah. Even though the Lord had kept her from conceiving. Elkanah's double portion is like God's provision in the pain. He is, he is giving her more because he knows what she's going through and Elkanah and God loved her regardless of what the circumstances looked like. And you need to know something today, you are loved. And no matter what the circumstances look like, God will, if your answer hasn't come, don't quit because God will give you a double portion of grace. God will make sure his grace is sufficient. He will make sure he's enough until your dream in God is realized. He knows your dream. He knows your desire. He knows your heart. And he knows that, that in the heart of it, you want it. He knows if you want it for his purposes or not. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So Elkanah. The double portion. Now, this double portion is an Old Testament idea, but it's really also a New Testament idea. And they had a double portion, like for, you know, maybe the first son, or they had double portions at times. And one of them is second in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. Now, you've heard of Elijah. Elijah was a mighty prophet in the land. In fact, Elijah was one that was on the mountain when Jesus' face shone like the sun. Elijah and Moses. In fact, people thought John the Baptist was Elijah. Elijah was, he represented the prophets to God. And Elijah certainly had the spirit on him. But he had a servant named Elisha. And Elisha watched him and he watched what God did in his life. And then when Elijah was getting ready, Jesus was, or God was going to take him up. Elisha had a request. We used to have an old song, you won't understand it, but it was called, Let Your Mantle Fall on Me. <laughs> and the mantle was like around the shoulders, this thing they wore, but he saw power in even the mantle of Elijah. And so Elisha noticed that God just moved in Elijah's life. He said, give me a double portion. That's what I want. Whatever you're doing in that, man, I want a double portion. Isn't that the way? Isn't that the cry of our hearts? Whatever you're doing, Lord, double it. Yeah. Now, well, okay, I'll get to that in a bit. I, here's the scripture. Elisha said, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. And he did. And then I love this. Isaiah 61, 7 is filled. Previous Israel has gone through suffering and they've gone through shame. And God is saying to the nation of Israel, in place of your shame, I'm going to give you a double portion. All oh, that God would pour out on his church this morning and give a double portion in the midst of what the culture is trying to do with shame and attack and removal of Jesus from everything, we are to be stronger than ever and say, Lord, a double portion. Amen. Amen. Praise his name. And so, a summary of that first part. God's providence was holding something back. But it was not for a plan B. It was for God's great purpose to come about. Well, I could tell you that now. 
that one of the greatest men that would ever come forward to guide God's people would be the prophet Samuel. He would be the only man that really played prophet, king, and priest. All three for Israel. He anointed the first two kings. Hannah didn't know when she was being prevented and being taunted. She didn't know that God was about to do something amazing through her body and bring about a revival in the land and a direction for God's people. Oh, that we would not have a limited perception. Pain is one thing. Even your past sins that God forgives, that's another thing. But for the church, one of the greatest difficulties is having a limited perception of who God is. If you don't believe this morning, remember this. Don't let your God be too small. He's a big God. He can do anything with him. All things are possible. If you only believe. All things. So then we look at Hannah's pursuit in prayer. Looking at verse 10. Deeply hurt. So just very quickly, she's being real. You don't have to pretend with God because he knows your heart. And, and if you're hurt, and you know, I don't know, you know, I don't know about these men that cry all the time, but Hannah was weeping in tears and deeply hurt, and she was real with God. Don't hide, be real, say, I'm hurt, I'm troubled. So be real when you're praying. And then also in verse 11, here's oh, such a big thing recognize. The power of God. Look at verse 11. Making a vow, she pleaded, Lord of armies. Isn't that a way to pray? Let me tell you where else that is. In 2 Kings chapter 6, there is this story. I'll have to really make it fast. Go home and read it. 2 Kings chapter 6. There is this king of Aram, a country that is tormenting Israel. He's out to destroy them. Kind of like today. Kind of like what's going on today. And, and, but something is happening to that king. Everything he tries to do, it seems like Israel knows what's going on and his plans get foiled. And so the king of Aram said, we must have a traitor in the house. And uh, the servant of the king said, oh, no, it's not that simple. <laughs> it's not that simple. You see, there's this man of God. <laughs> there's this woman of God. There's this person that is so anointed with God that God is just revealing to them even what you speak in secret in your bedroom, that man knows your plans. <laughs> and so the king naturally, he says, we got to get this guy. We got to capture him. We got to get him. I, you know, probably need to kill him, but we got to get him. That's what they want to do with you today if you're a light for Jesus. We got to get them. There are more plans to surround you and get you than you can imagine. But are you a woman of God this morning? Are you a man of God this morning? He will reveal himself to you. And he will reveal what the enemy is trying to do. And so this king... He put all of his armies and chariots and horses, and he surrounded, and really surrounded Elijah, surrounding the city. So Elijah's servant goes out in the morning, and he looks, and he goes running to Elijah. Elijah, you won't believe this. We are surrounded. They've got you all surrounded. Look. And Elijah, Elijah looked. And then you know what he said? Lord, open his eyes. This is a powerful story. Yeah. He said, open his eyes. Wait a minute. His eyes were open. No, they were not. There are physical eyes and there are spiritual eyes. And he was looking with his physical eyes and 
the servant was, and Elijah was saying, Lord, open his eyes. And what he was saying is, I want you to know something. It's not we that are surrounded. It's the king of Aram that's surrounded. And they, the servant suddenly looked, and he didn't just see chariots and horses and armies. He saw surrounding the king of Aram and all of his troops. He saw chariots of fire and angel armies that were surrounding him. So when Hannah prays, Lord of armies, <laughs> praise, isn't that a powerful way to pray? It's not, oh, Lord, I don't know if maybe you, you oh, do you really understand what's going on? This is tougher than probably you knew. I've told you a thousand times, God is not scratching his head going, what do I do now? He knows what's going on. And I want you to know that if you'll walk in the spirit, if you'll get out of the flesh and walk in the spirit, your enemy is surrounded. By angel armies. Oh, man. This is not emotional preaching. This is biblical truth. We need to hold on to it. We need to walk in it. We don't need to clap at the end of the movie. That's not what it is. It's not over. You're in the battle. With angel armies, the Lord of armies. So she, in verse 11, the second half of verse 11, chap, the verse 11 is a sermon by itself. So in, a, in the second half, she says, if you'll take notice, she was being real. She recognized the power of God, and then she made a humble request. If you will take notice of your servant. You don't come to the Lord ordering him around. You come to the Lord asking. Yes. Kneeling. Yes. Asking. Lord, if you'll take notice of me this morning, I'm your servant. If you'll just hear me, if you, if you would this morning, Lord of armies, if you'll do that, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a vow with you. Listen carefully to this, folks. Jesus entered a covenant for you. I want you to measure in your heart this morning if you have made a vow with the Lord. But maybe you are not really following through. I'm asking you to make a vow to the Lord, and I'll explain that a little bit more. Because here's what a vow looks like. If you'll make me a millionaire, I'll give you half of it. If you'll give me perfect health, I'll go... I'll go and serve you. Here was her vow. Here's the only way you can really do this. Here's her vow. If you will give me a son, I will give him back to you. There's no bargain here. See, people, well, I'll bargain with God. There's no bargain with God. He's already got more than you could ever offer him. But if you do ask him of something, what he wants is you to be willing to surrender it. And she's going, give me a son and I'll give him up. Now, if you want to pray for God to give you something, just here's what it means. It doesn't mean you always have to give away whatever God gives. God loves to bless his children. But you need to surrender everything he gives. Your health, your finances, your family, your home, your children. You can pray for them and ask God to give you blessings in all of those areas. But you must surrender them back to Jesus. Back to God. And that's what she said. Oh my goodness. So it's not a, it's not a bargain it's a humble request. 
with a huge release. Sure. Would you please give me? Uh, would you please? Take it back. What if you operated in your job like that? What if you operated in your neighborhood like that? Would you please give me this neighborhood? I give it to you. Whatever you do, it's for your glory. Okay, so we got to keep moving. Well, I do have to bring up this illustration. I do. My mother was a preacher. She was a fiery preacher and a fiery lady. I She would scare us if she was here today. She would scare us. I mean, okay, I know some of... <laughs> hallelujah. She'd be prancing around the auditorium praising the Lord and floating on air somehow. I don't know what it was. She didn't mind standing up in the middle, middle of my preaching and taking over. It was, just, but she was, but she was in the Lord. She was in the Lord. But she used to preach and she'd give this illustration. And just being a good son, I copied it. There are two things. I, I mean, I copied some of her illustrations. And um, she was so good at that. Yeah, yeah. And she would, she would give, she gave a reading, the touch of the master's hand, which was just amazing. But she gave this illustration. There was this man named Laterno, and he was a heavy equipment owner, uh, manufacturer. And he had been a Christian, strong Christian, and he got his business got into trouble. And he was a tither and a giver for missions, and he started to cut back just to try to save a little here or there. So he cut back on his giving, and he got behind three years on pledges. And his business was doing worse, can't imagine. Anyway, so he said to the Lord, one bargain, but he said to the Lord, Lord, I have failed. But if you will bless my business, I won't give you 10%. Now, you got to listen to all this. He said, I'll give you half of everything. So he did. His wife said, I agree. And they couldn't even meet payroll. And within no time, the company was flourishing and they were giving half. And then his wife came to him and said, I think we should give half of our half to missions. And he said, okay. And God still blessed him. And you know, in the end, he decided he'd live on 10% and give God 90. And that story is documented when you research. He lived out his final years living on the 10% because God had blessed him so much. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, that's right. That's true. So this Laterno, he his he has a college that still exists. I read up on him. Laterno is uh, he's got a, a university, Laterno University in Texas. He also had a Laterno um, Manufacturing Technical Institute, which was sold out. God blessed him, but he he went, he used it for missions. I am just saying. The bargain is not for how much can I get, it's how much can I give back. And God will bless you for that. Amen? Amen. Well, let's look at verse 12, 13, 14, 15, really quick. Hannah's persistence in prayer. While she continued praying in the Lord's presence, Eli watched her mouth. Hannah was praying silently, and though her lips were moving, her voice could not be heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long are you going to be drunk? Get rid of your wine. No, my Lord, Hannah replied, I am a woman with a broken heart. I haven't had any wine or beer. I've been pouring out my heart before the Lord. She stayed in his presence, in God's presence. And she was there, and I want to tell you something else. Um, she was seeking God's attention, not Eli's. Um, I can tell you, what do you mean by that, Sam? Well, here's what I mean. I know that when you're really broke, there is a temptation to call your richest relative and say, would you please pray with me that God will provide some finances? Okay. 
That's not faith. That's high-level begging. Pick your poorest relative <laughs> and pray that God will bless them <laughs> and see what God does. Because this whole Christianity thing is not about getting and getting and getting. It's about giving and giving and giving. For God so loved the world that he got all of our attention. No, that he gave. His one and only son. Hannah had a heart like that. I want to challenge you, moms. You've got kids here today. Maybe your kids are grown, but you've got things on your heart. Men pray like Hannah did. Okay, let's keep going. So she's not doing this to get the attention of Eli. That's why there's no words coming out. She's doing it to get the attention of God. In fact, she was scolded by Eli misunderstood by Eli, and then she says, no, listen to me carefully. Out of my broken heart. And then she goes on to admit something. There's something good about confession. In verse 16, she said, I've been praying from the depth of my anguish and resentment. Now, it's one thing to be in anguish, but it's another thing. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, yeah. Out of, it is one thing to be in anguish, but resentment had come up. And she says, I'm praying with a broken heart out of anguish and out of resentment. The confession. You know, the odd thing about it is that resentment comes when we have not yet seen the hand of God. <laughs> When we have not yet seen the hand of God, resentment comes. If we know that God is moving and we have trust in him, there won't be resentment. In fact, please don't waste your time with the enemy. Don't give him a foothold. Just keep praying through the pain. And finally, in verse 17 and 18, she gets words of encouragement. Eli responded and said, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant the request you made of him. And she said, may your servant <laughs> find favor with you. And she went on her way. She ate and no longer looked despondent. Well, I tell you what happens. Let's just jump down to 20. 19 and 20, the next morning, Elkanah and Hannah got up early to worship before the Lord. And then they went home and, and they were intimate and the Lord remembered her. That word in the Hebrew is he marked her. <laughs> I'm putting a mark on you. God is going to do something great in your life. I'd like to put a mark on you this morning. Can I do that? Amen. I want to put a mark on all of you that God is going to do something great in your life. The Lord has not forgotten. He remembers and it isn't like he forgot. But when it said he remembered, he's putting a mark on you. And you're going to realize what God has planned for you that's bigger and better than any request that you could have. And she, so it ends up saying, and the Lord remembered her, and she conceived and gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel. Oops, Samuel. I got to tell you, I was down in I was down in Florida. Yes, I am wrapping up. I promise. I was down in Florida, and I was paying for something in one of those, you know, lovely tourist <laughs> tourist stores. And and the guy, I mean, he did have a skin color that was very unique. And uh, so he's look. He's I'm handing my credit card, and then he said, "Nice to see you, Shamul." I said, "Shamul, okay." And he said, that's your name in Hebrew. Well, it is. It's really close to that. And so I mentioned that one time in a sermon. And now I got people that call me Shemuel. Oh, hi, Shemuel. But she named him Shemuel because she says, I've asked of God. I want you to give God the glory after he answers. I want you to keep praising him after you get what you've desired. And actually, 
Shemuel's name means heard of God. He had been hearing all along. Are you discouraged? He hears you. Are you discouraged? He's marked you. Are you discouraged? I will give you a double portion to replace your shame this morning. Get out of shame wherever you are. Don't walk in shame. Don't walk in the past. And don't walk in the pain. Walk through the pain until God's providence comes up. Remember, if you pray through the pain, God is bigger than what? Fill in the blank. He's bigger than anything that you can imagine. So I'll just close with asking those questions again. What's the one unfulfilled deep desire of your heart this morning? In your anguish, is there any resentment that God needs to remove so he can be proved in your life? And finally, can you pray through the pain when you can't see through the plan? <laughs>